good afternoon. It is afternoon, so good afternoon. And welcome. This is the first in the annual bi-weekly seminar series for the Burma Institute of Bioethics. I'm Jeff Kahn, I'm the director, for those of you who I don't know. It's a pleasure to have everybody back for the fall, and it's an even greater pleasure to welcome <laughs> Professor Jonathan Moreno as our first speaker this fall. Probably needs a little introduction for many of you, but let me do this anyway. As you see on the slide, Jonathan holds the David and Lynn Sultan University Professorship at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a, a longtime uh, scholar in bioethics. Um, I think of him as kind of a mentor of mine in a, in a way. We met in the mid 1990s when we both worked on the White House Advisory Committee for Human Radiation Experiments, which has got an important link, I think, to this talk in that um, as a function of that work, Jonathan and many of us as well became very interested in history as it relates to bioethics and the issues that we focus on. And Jonathan, um, maybe more than any of us, took that interest and really developed it as part of his scholarly work. So as a function of that, he wrote a, a book and um, several articles related to national security and ethics, including the book titled uh, Mind Wars. I commend it to you if you have not read it. He also has a new book about to come out, uh, co-authored with Amy Gutman, the president of the University of Pennsylvania. Maybe he'll say more about that. It's an opportunity to give it a little uh, preview. Advanced sales on Amazon, I'm sure. <laughs> And he's also about to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Professional Society for Bioethics called the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. And so for those of you who will be in Anaheim um, in October, we can all look forward to Mickey or Goofy or somebody handing you the Lifetime Achievement Award. The meeting will be in, at Disneyland um, this year. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Jonathan back, he's been to Hopkins many times, but to um, deliver our first Permanent Institute Seminar of the Year, as it says here, entitled Bioethics and Advocacy, is that so wrong? So thank you, Jonathan, for being here and joining me and welcoming him. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to Berman and uh, Jeff and uh, uh, my old colleagues and my new colleagues and colleagues to be. Uh, lovely to see you. So. Um, I must say that when I look at and think about the title, I think about our uh, late friend John Harris, uh, who used to say stuff like, you know, so-and-so, is that so wrong? Uh, I guess that um, the, the music of this title really is uh, dedicated to John. Um, so uh, when Jeff asked me to do this talk, uh, I thought, well, okay, so this is a bespoke talk. I've never given it before. Uh, we'll probably never give it again, uh, and um, and yet uh, it, it's it, it's material that has interested me for a long time. When I got to the Hastings Center in the mid 1980s, I found myself as fascinated by the sociology of bioethics uh, as I was the practice of bioethics, whatever the practice of bioethics is. Um, and there were too many people, I gotta say, who found the sociology of bioethics all that interesting at that time. Um, but it's, it's something that uh, stuck in my mind, and that actually, Jeff mentioned this, when we worked uh, for Ruth on the Radiation Advisory Committee in the mid-90s, um, I was struck by the fact that bioethics could be seen uh, as having a role in national security policy, which is one way I, I, I think of what we did. And so then, so the pre, my previous question, like in the mid '80s, was, well, how do bioethicists get into, into the inner sanctum of the hospitals? People like me, I'm a philosopher, not a physician. How, how the hell did that happen? Uh, that is really weird. That would never have happened in the 1960s, and yet it happened in the 1980s. Uh, Rush and I were uh, on what was, um, I guess, my second ethics committee at Children's National Medical Center. I was also at one of the in the 80s. I said, how, how did I, she's, she's a medical person, how the hell did I get here? So I was really interested in the sociology of bioethics in, in, in that respect, and then getting into the national security stuff and continuing since the mid-90s. 
Um, how much more time do I have to talk? Because I just spent 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 I've just gotten into the talk. Uh, but I, I, and I have had multiple experiences with advocacy uh, and, and, and so forth. So um, this is really a um, this is really a, the argument, I guess, of the talk. Uh, I think bioethics is these three things. Now, it's more than this, too, but I think it's at least uh, these three things. It's a field of study, an implicit social reform movement, and, and I'm going to try to prove that. And I think that's easy to show. I think that's low-hanging fruit to show that. And I also, and I struggle with this word, it's an also an invitation to advocacy, or an opportunity to be an advocate with a certain kind of credibility and legitimacy, even if it's I mean, limited credibility and legitimacy, as in my case. Um, so let me see if I can orient you to the way I'm thinking about this. Here's an analogy. Um, consider the progressive education movement. I don't think probably many of you are interested in the history of the progressive education movement, but I'm a fan of John Dewey. I was a graduate school of philosophy, or I got into Dewey. And Dewey is a big person in progressive education, and it left a huge mark. One that even uh, the current sector of education is having a hard time erasing. Uh, so it, it was a field of study. People in the late 19th century, early 20th century, were getting very interested in how kids learn. Uh, what is the what's the process? What's the what, what's the mechanism um, of learning? Uh, influenced partly by what was being learned in labs about the way. The brain works here, with people like William James going to, to uh, Germany and watching frogs get good second and shot. You know. So gradually education was becoming something like medicine, uh, a science-based field. Uh, and then, then people thought, in light of the, this data, so to speak, um, you know, what happened? classrooms uh, need to change. Uh, and some people advocated for science labs. Uh, so that when I was in the worst high school in New York State, uh, north of Yonkers, because I'm sure there were south of Yonkers, there were some other ones that were really bad. But I was in one that the, the State University of New York would not even send its student teachers to. Uh, really bad. Um, but we had, in the chemistry lab had, a chemistry class had a lab in the back. So the idea was that you, you, you learned and then you did. Now mostly I learned or didn't learn and I blew things up. But you know, this was a concept that you have to combine theory and action. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a uh, uh, an example. Try to get more into it. And then, oh, by the way, progressive education pretty much won that. Uh, it's not supposed to be. It's particularly in the sciences and little kids. You're not supposed to use their hands and so forth. Uh, um, so um, now I'm going to give you an example from our field. And I say, uh oh, because. Um, somebody said you're a prisoner of your examples. So please don't make me argue about the example. Uh, but I think, nonetheless, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that take the field of human research ethics. Um, the Belmont Principles articulated a study for your study of not only the episode, uh, the syphilis study, uh, and other uh, experiments going on awry, but also uh, philosophy and law and so forth. Um, and then uh, there's a social reform movement that came out of that. It's called modern bioethics. I'll come back to that. Um, what came out of that was a, was a system oriented at least to the elements of prior review and consent <coughs> experiments. Um, and then some people advocated for special protections for some people. So for example, still not in place, special protections for people uh, who have uh, cognitive disorders or are in some way unable to give full informed consent. We still haven't settled that. Uh, that, number, that report was actually written by the National Commission. It's one of the, one of the recommendations that never got into, into any version of the rules and regs uh, in the federal system uh, because, well, for a lot of reasons. So, um, so this is my effort to, again, yeah, try to orient it a little bit to what the argument this. But I have to step back and say, my whole case assumes a certain view of the history of bioethics, or what the historians call historiography of bioethics. So one view is that basically um, what, what people who are interested in bioethics do is just another kind of, uh, this is a, it's another version of, it's a somewhat uh, 
quantitatively different version of, the hit of medical ethics that had been done in the ancient world with a few tweaks. Um, and this is a view that is, uh, that I think Ed Pellegrino, uh, my that dear friend Ed Pellegrino had, um, and a view that is held by many people in Europe, for example. Um, but most Americans, I would say, in this, particularly in, in secular contexts, who uh, do bioethics, really think of bioethics, modern bioethics, as something different. Not just uh, quantitatively different, qualitatively different. That the emphasis on patients' rights, truth-telling, self-determination, it's a new field. <coughs> and it, it became new gradually in the late 1960s. That's what most American bioethics, I think, uncritically uh, think is the case. Uh, and if that is true, I'm going to try to say, if that is, if it's true that that's the way most people in at least American or North American bioethics think of bioethics, uh, then I think I can show that modern bioethics is implicitly a social reform movement. And I'm going to uh, try to do that by giving you uh, an example from a textbook that I, I'm hoping none of you have read. <laughs> Anybody know this textbook? Okay, so. Um, the story is, this is a textbook by uh, Edmund Healy, who was a, um, a Jesuit and a professor at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, and the, the way that I discovered this book, this is 1956, and the way I discovered this book was when I was teaching at Dallas State Medical School, there was an ancient professor of anatomy. And when I say ancient, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, real. He was, interestingly, by the way, I'm teaching history of bioethics now, so forgive me, because uh, I'm doing a lot of footnotes here. Uh, yeah, just you know, you know, that um, He was a statistician in the anatomy department. Why were there statisticians in the anatomy departments? There are a lot of them. This is a measure of the size and shape of the head and the face. It was, you might say, quasi-eugenic uh, specialization. And he was, he was a statistician. He was, they were really trying to, you know, to move him out of his office. The office was in a basement. It was piled up with old books. And uh, he had some old books that the library would take. So he got a library carriage and wheeled it into my office. This is a true story. Probably 1989. Because he thought, at Dallas State Medical Center, there's only one philosophy who could possibly be interested in these old books. And that's this guy in the So he wrote it. And I saw that. And this particular book that he wrote really struck me because it is a textbook of medical ethics in 1956. Okay, so this is very interesting. What were people saying about medical ethics in 56? And, and this is all going to my argument about the second interpretation history of historiography of, of bioethics. The things really changed. Um, so the book is set up as a series of cases. Uh, he was a, a Jesuit, so there's a, there's a case, there's uh, a, a, an analysis, and then there's an explanation. Right? Um, so this is case 10, considering the nature of his disease from a patient. Uh, Miss A has conjugate sarcoma. Who can tell us what conjugate sarcoma is? Sir? It's a cancer. Yeah. Of the connective tissue. Connective tissue, and it's slow growing, but it's often associated with the immune system. Generally, people have an older people, I understand, or people have compromised immune systems. Is that right for the people who work on compromised immune Not necessarily. It proves to be not necessarily older people, as I'll show you. Okay. So she says, tell me, she pleads with Dr. B, do I have, really have cancer? Dr. B, knowing that this day has ample time to prepare for death, and wishing to spare her needless mental suffering answers, your pains are due to our virus.
medical students last week what the term therapeutic exception means. Do you think any of them do? Not a lot. Some of you don't do either. Look it up. Um, so, okay, well, this case, when I ran across it, it really struck me. Because when I was five and a half years old or so, uh, my mother was diagnosed with a chondrosarcoma. 1957, 1958. This is the only time I'll get a picture of the New York Times magazine. Um, fortunately, they were in the afford to buy me a shirt not long after this day. Um, so my mother was a young woman. She was uh, diagnosed with was 39 years old. Well, it was actually a doctor's probably just 40. Uh, I don't remember my mother looking this way. Uh, she lost her uh, right arm after Kyle Cole was amputated. And the, these days, surgeons tell me they would have done limb sparing surgery, but they didn't uh, in the late 50s. So uh, her life was saved, a happy ending. Uh, she lived for uh, until she was 99, and so 40, and had a very uh, successful career as a therapist, be famous. Her papers are we're opening up her papers at the Catholic Library on Thursday. Uh, but this was a turning point, obviously, for her and for me. Uh, so I was really astonished, right? Uh, now, of course, um, she had to be told what she had because she was getting ready for an amputation. Um, so that kind of answered that part of the story for me. But um, what if they had decided not to do that? Um, what would, would Dr. Healy's answer to his case have been? Well, this is simple. Uh, if Miss A really has arthritis, or if Dr. B is convinced that everyone in our age does have to be saying mild case of arthritis, his answer is not really wrong. Okay, that settles that. Then I went to the library as a medical student in Loyola in 56. I got the answer, now I can go back. Take care of my patient. So I can uh, now, if I had any doubts about it, um, this is good for the lawyer. If I had any doubts about it, I could read the explanation. Notice that Dr. B does not occur to the same thing to do solely to arthritis. If she does have arthritis, even on a mild form, Dr. B is justified in thinking that her pain is due in part to the arthritis. And hence, his answer is not a lie. If the same really wanted the entire truth, having been to law school, perhaps, she would ask, are all my pains due to arthritis? You see, that's the problem with patients. <laughs> they don't know how to ask a question. <laughs> uh, in such cases, patients often do not wish to pursue the matter, preferring to accept an answer which leaves them some way of hope, even though in their hearts they know what the facts are. Now, um, I, it's easy to pick on somebody, right, 70 years ago, almost 60 years ago, or 60 years ago. But um, this is not out of line with attitudes, as we know, of the era. Uh, and this is really important to my argument, because what I'm trying to show again is that the standard American view, the second view of hysterical and bioethics is a powerful one, a uh, powerful case to be made. That truth-telling, consent, and self-determination really changed the field. Um, so, we um, do have more information, so this is actually Tom and Jen, which is biomedical ethics, uh, we can show this. Uh, uh, the first people who clued me into this. This is a, 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 a survey that was done in 61. It turns out that hardly anybody, uh, any doctors who were surveyed tell them to use the word cancer in their patients in 61. So, you know, we've got plenty of evidence here. Uh, it, the, the, Dr. Healy is a dramatic example, but not an outlier. And then, you know, just 18 years later, and here, my whole bioethics course from my undergrad to Penn is about this. What happened between 1960 and 1980? That's, this is the core question that helps to explain where violence came from. Uh, so, um, what were the reasons? Tom and Jim and the principles. Nice list of the reasons for the change. Uh, again, you can spend uh, an hour on each of these items. Uh, and, I would say, the institutions start to pop. I would say as more effective than cause. Uh, you get people like Dan Callahan and Will Galen at, at a holiday party in Hastings on Hudson in 1968, 69, 
and uh, Will Gale, the psychiatrist, Stan Callahan, philosopher at the Population Council, they see all kinds of interesting stuff going on, organ transplants, and genetics, and experiments that are scandalizing people getting in the newspaper. We should actually form a group to talk about these things. That becomes the case concern. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Kennedy of Ethics, to a great extent, because of the interest of the Kennedy family in Down's Babies, uh, a film that I would show in my class, who should survive? Very powerful uh, film that uh, becomes the first project of it, but, but then becomes the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. And then uh, the second in values, uh, which was sold in the current age, two other organizations. SHB, largely dominated by theologians, by the way, I think it's fair to say, that as the philosophers and lawyers get more prominent in bioethics in the 70s, the theologians fade out. Uh, and that's a part of the sociology that I also. Not enough, it's still there, it's still there, so they see a few people. Uh, but in general, the influence of the theologians starts to fade, I think partly because of the introduction of the law. And legal cases become so critical. Uh, now, the philosophers don't the law, I don't know. Anyway, here we go. Right, so then you have the commissions. Uh, and the way I describe this is, again, kind of a long conversation about this, but it seems to me that part of these, what biologics commissions do is codify consensus-based uh, norms and values. And I think you can make that case for, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, pretty much all of these entities, uh, with one interesting exception, uh, namely President George W. Bush's counsel uh, uh, between uh, 011 and 08. Um, so we can, and we can talk more about this if you like. But here's what I mean by referring particularly to the counsel. Um, in 1994, I published a book that I know you all to be. Uh, well, I'm together. <laughs> got vanished, but that's okay. Uh, and in deciding together, I, I, I try to take a look back at the first uh, 30 years or so of bioethics, five years of bioethics. And I ask the question um, implicitly what are people in bioethics doing? Well, what they're doing is sort of they're kind of leading from behind. You know, they are codifying. Um, Take up nine, take rules for human experiments, take gene splicing, whatever the topic is, they're codifying uh, values that are kind of implicit in the public discourse uh, and, uh, and then trying to articulate them a little more clearly so that they can be, we can have some guidance based on this codification. And, 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 and so what do I have to worry about? Well, what they have to worry about is not getting too far ahead of the polity. Uh, and, and how do you do that? Well, you have all what philosophers call side constraints. So uh, you kind of toss up the really extreme crazy views. Uh, you have diversity of input, like on ethics committees and IRBs. That's the moral consensus. Overlapping, you know, overlapping consensus, some political philosophers call it plural, whatever you like, pluralistic liberalism. Okay. And that seems to be working out reasonably well, I think, for a while. Then, Things get a little crazy. Uh, and part of what happens is, I think, in the late 90s, and this is highly oversimplified, we can argue about it, in the late 90s, what starts to happen, this is sort of posted by a great agent of our youth committee, is uh, you have cloning and you have the isolation of human embryonic stem cells. You also have the fact that these, um, these, these incidents come to the attention of a more and more organized uh, pro life movement. And so the, the sort of the, um, the policy folks, the, the, the movement people, the pro-life movement, and the, uh, the, and the conservative elites start talking to each other more and more in the late 90s. So that by the time you have uh, George W. Bush running against Al Gore, uh, this is not a top three or four or five item, but they have to be, each, each candidate has to say something about stem cells, <coughs> which is really weird. Uh, and, and, and you can kind of prove yourself uh, with your base uh, on this stem cell issue. Even John McCain, by the way, had, was supposed to do that, and he kind of failed uh, when he ran against Obama. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't exactly conservative enough on the stem cell issue, in a way. All right, so now, it, by, the, by the early, and by the way, you may not know this, but when George W. Bush um, was in his first summer in the White House, he had a number of meetings with distinguished bioethicists, uh, Dan Callahan, 
Leroy Walters, and Leon Cass go on the list. Uh, with Karl Rove, uh, his political architect, Leroy Rove, prepared for all these meetings. Uh, because he was trying to decide what to do about human embryonic stem cell research. And he gave a famous speech on August 9th, 2001, from the Crawford Branch, in which he established his policy. Okay. He then also announced in that speech that he was creating a Bible Council. Now, this council was to be chaired by one of the people who advised him on the stem cell issue. Stay with me. I'm, I'm really am talking about my topic. <laughs> <laughs> so this council, um, under, under, really under Leon in particular, um, oops, uh, this was the charge for the council. And what's interesting about this charge, you see, is that, it, that um, as, as President Bush signed it, um, it specifically rules out uh, a finding a consensus position on an ethical issue. And this is quite different, I argue, from the consensus orientation of the field before that, including the commissions, and including most people who are writing about the issues. And um, so what happened? Well, what happened is that I think pretty clear, actually, it's not what I think. Uh, many of the of the social conservatives on the Cass Council uh, were highly suspicious of the um, political orientation, philosophical political orientation of academic bioethicists in general. And so what uh, the consensus views seem to squelch reasonable minority views, it seemed to them. So they were going to deal with this problem by not attempting to reach consensus, as you see on their council. They were instead going to uh, try to elevate the conversation to what I call the richer bioethics. So let's take more seriously the questions about the beginning of human life. Um, let's take more seriously the implications of new forms of making babies for families, and so forth. Um, by the way, nonetheless, they did try to seek consensus. It's very hard to have an advisory committee for a president without having some recommendations that are consensus-based. Right? All right. Uh, and now, um, and interestingly, my, my, my friend at UCSD, John Evans, who, by the way, is a fabulous commentator on the sociology of bioethics. Uh, John, if you don't know who he is, John, before he went to grad school, uh, worked for progressive process organizations like Campbell Hill's lobbies. Uh, so he brings that experience in his work. Uh, and, and he published a book that I think is quite interesting in 2011, <coughs> in which he makes the, the following um, argument. First, uh, in, in, everybody knows what principalism here, in empirically formed principalism, it remains advisable for the policy, e.g., in federal commission work. So, okay, the Bush Council is a, the exception proves the rule, but reform is still good. We, we should, we in bioethics, should try to reform doctor patient relations and all the institutions of medicine. And, and life sciences in such a way that we respect patient values and uh, we respect determination and so forth. Um, however, he says, what we have learned from that nasty period when liberal bioethicists had a break with conservative bioethicists during the stem cell cloning era, what we have learned is that they should have juror media interviews uh, <laughs> traps for public consumption, communication through social movement organizations, etc. In other words, no ads. That's what I take that to mean. Uh, and then he says, you know, this would be much better because we, we couldn't discredit bioethics. You know, people were discrediting bioethics in the Cass Council uh, during the Cass Council days uh, because they were so they seemed to be so ideological. Yeah, you could dismiss both sides. So I, I called John. I called John when I was uh, putting this talk together. I said, John, I'm doing this talk for Jeff and advocacy, and I'm looking at your book again. It's seven years now since you wrote this, and we're now in a new era. What do you think? And he said, you know, A, I haven't really thought of it this much, but B, I'm so, not so sure. I'm not so sure. Uh, norms and values don't matter. 
Uh, and we need to take advocacy more seriously. So I would take these two reports, we mentioned a couple of times, the Advisory Committee report on human radiation experiments and this report that I was part of on embryonic stem cell research. I would take these two reports uh, as, uh, as not advocacy, but as social reform. In the case of the Acre uh, Committee, uh, we're trying to not, not only dig up the history of human radiation experiments, but also develop rules that we thought uh, would reach a broad agreement in society about how we should treat those historic experiments, whether there should be sanctions, and how we should go forward. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, looking at Jeremy, actually doing empirical work to figure out what, this, what the values are and how we can do that. Uh, and then I think the guidelines, you could argue, but I think guidelines, we presupposed that people thought that some human embryonic system research was acceptable. In fact, so did Bush. He funded research on 21 lines during the administration. Then the question was, what are the rules? Uh, and he put them in, in, in primates, the, if, you, if you do, what, uh, when do you do that, and so forth. Both social reform, it seems to me. However, I had my problems. The same time that I was uh, co-chair of that committee on human and social research, I was also a, uh, a senior fellow at a think tank called the Center for American Progress. Uh, and um, Ron Ashpaguru, who you might have seen uh, Friday night, substituting for David Brooks, as he does once in a while, on the news hour um, at the National Review, very intelligent fellow, no doubt, uh, conservative, uh, uh, philosophically, and good, you know, conservative policy person. Uh, he really went after us on uh, advocating for human embryonic stem cell research. Me, too. The so called ethicist, I think mean, he wrote was. Okay, I don't mind. You know, I can handle it. Uh, so, we, so my, uh, my uh, assistant, I, Sam Berger, who's back in the White House, until I went back, wrote a response. And then, Panura wrote a response. And then we wrote a response. <laughs> So this went on for a week. And I think the last one that Panura wrote, he said something like, these are not serious people. That really pissed me off. <laughs> uh, so I went in the office, and I said, we got to write something. And then I was Sam or some other junior person said, Jonathan, you've got to realize, this is what they do. They'll just keep doing this. You know, you got to cut bait at a certain point. OK, so we didn't go on. But I have to say that that week, I realized that I was, I was starting to have uh, And I wasn't completely comfortable with it. Uh, however, uh, I am going to say, I mean, I was, well, I, was, I, was, I was totally comfortable with my position. I wasn't totally comfortable with the role, the, the, the ambiguity of the role. Uh, however, I have to say that we won. Uh, we were right. Uh, part of the old argument was uh, that uh, induced prepotent stem cells is all you need. And that turns out not to be true. So, and partly the identification of the pathway to Zika virus ought to show that. So, okay. Uh, so if I've convinced you that bioethics is in part a social reform movement, I believe it is. Maybe I haven't convinced you, but I still believe it is. Then we're in an interesting era now. Because um, one of the core assumptions of bioethics, not only in this country, certainly, but in the global bioethics movement, uh, where some of us have spent some time, is uh, that there's a, there's a universality to these rules. Uh, and that they are evidence-based, and, and so forth. And more than that, so these are just some, you know, choose your nightmare headline of the day, from my point of view. Uh, but I think more than that, I think bioethics is part of what the political scientists call the international liberal order. So what is the international liberal order? Uh, as said quite well by George Packer a few months ago in the New Yorker, uh, beginning with, uh, with the, with the uh, uh, Atlantic uh, ch uh, Charter signed by FDR and Winston Churchill in 1941 at the outset of the war. Uh, it's a network of institutions and alliances, the UN, NATO, the, IF, the International Monetary System, that have become the foundation for the rules-based international I believe that, that bioethics has become, is part of the rules-based international order. We don't 
think of it so much in the United States. We don't really care about the international <laughs> order so much in the US. Um, but if you do bioethics elsewhere, I hope my colleagues who have done it elsewhere will back me up. You'll hear about these other positions, these, these documents and organizations. Uh, uh, so this is what it is. Uh, there are three elements, uh, generally according to one book of scientists in the dialogue. Um, the economic order, as it, uh, can be, for example, the National Monetary Fund, the security order, the case of NATO, and then there's the human rights order. And probably bioethics mainly fits into the into the human rights work. Um, so I just jot jotted down some of the statements from some of the uh, documents that come out of this <laughs> international world work that, it, that are, in which bioethics is particularly uh, prominent or relevant. The Code, the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights, uh, the Council of Europe the Yale Convention, and you could go down, there's, there's more, but then the slide gets too messy. Um, by the way, the word dignity appears several times. I know our friend Ruth Macklin thinks dignity is stupid, uh, and it's a plausible philosophical argument. Uh, but if you try to take dignity out of, you know, of universal human rights documents, you're left with a, a big hole philosophically. I mean, the argumentation of a lot of international human rights efforts is based on some notion of dignity as obscure as it might be. And I think, by the way, although Ruth isn't here, it's sort of unfair, but I think, by the way, that her reaction to, uh, this is 12 years ago, or sorry, 10 years ago, her reaction to the use of dignity in bioethics discourse was partly a reaction to the way that the conservative bioethicists were promoting dignity in their terms uh, at that time. Um, so I, don't, I think we don't, we don't give our opinion so easily. We don't, we don't give, it to, give it to them so easily. So I'm not saying that these institutions I spent seven years of my life on the International Bioethics Committee of UNESCO. Believe me, I know, nobody reads our reports. Although I, I would love for you to go to the website for UNESCO and look at a couple of the reports. They're pretty good. Uh, some of these organizations are very meaningful. Some of them are, are mainly producing aspirational documents. Um, you know, but they are part of the human conversation, the human global conversation. And we are part of it. Uh, and then, sort of secondary, but related, this is WTO, Ultra Property Issues, not related to bioethics, the ICC, which of course we're not even going near the ICC, uh, the Declaration of Geneva, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological Council. All these are also secondarily related to bioethics. So, uh, this is what I finally going to leave you with, sorry, a few more minutes. Um, very nice remark by Bob Baker 20 years ago. The, the preamble to the Council of Europe exemplifies the conception of national bioethics as an ethics of covenants and conventions of grounding human rights. So what happens when that international system begins to weaken? This, I think, this is a question I don't want the answer to. Does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter for our regular practice, or maybe it matters a lot. But um, it seems to me that uh, Part of the grounding of bioethics as a social reform movement, as occasionally as an opportunity for efficacy, presupposes some kind of international system of norms and values and institutions that remind us of those norms and values. And to the extent that that is weakened, I think it undermines um, some of the assumptions that we routinely make in the field, uh, in the field of bioethics. And I'm going to stop there and look forward to your questions, comments, and outrage. <laughs> well, thanks for that. All right, so we, we have um, 20 minutes for discussion. You're going to raise your hand. We, Emmy has a microphone. Please wait for the mic so that we all can hear and the recording can capture. Maybe we can do a very short introduction of who you are. Uh, hi, I'm um, Justin Bernstein, I'm the fellow of uh, Edgar Hopkins. I just was hoping you'd say a bit more what we mean by social reform as distinct from advocacy. So it seems like one of the main distinctions that came out was yeah. I think that something like overlapping consensus seems to be what differentiates the two as opposed to some sort of comprehensive values or controversial view. I guess I wonder why you think that necessarily. I mean, there are social reform movements that definitely didn't have that sort of political consensus in the past. So I just want to get a little bit clearer on what you think the distinction between those two are. You know, it's, it's not math. Uh, I think of, 
of advocates is people who are trying to push a particular policy or for a particular problem a little faster, uh, move it a little bit more than, um, than other sectors of society might be ready for or might be thinking about. Um, that's, you know, it's rough and ready. Um, but there is a certain point, and I, again, yeah, use myself as an example, when I was doing that back and forth with Panuru, uh, when I became an advocate, and I kind of felt like I was losing my, losing my head. You know, and I was, well, some, some of the assertions I was making were maybe a little more bold. Uh, and frankly, I didn't want to be that again, so I thought I might not. It's too embarrassing. But um, my guess is I was pushing, I was probably pushing harder than you and I as careful actors. So I don't have, I don't have for it, for it. Uh, and this is why I say we're prisoners of our examples, right? But um, again, so I go back to progressive education. You could have reformed the way that schools were teaching um, without pushing in particular for labs in the back of the science class. Uh, you, could have, you could have had, I mean, contrary to fact, you could have had um, the Belmont report without the four years of previous reports about uh, special populations. And you certainly, obviously, did not get that one particular group that they advocated for, the people institutionalized as mentally ill, which we've tried a few times and can't make any headway about. So I don't have a, no, I'm hedging. But I nonetheless think that there is a moment where you can sort of feel yourself moving more into an advocacy posture. Very interesting and uh, provocative talk. And it, I mean, this is a topic we, lots of us, struggle with. I'm still not sure quite where I land on it. Um, but if we are, you know, in it for, or if we are a social reform movement, I mean, the degree to which no one reads the reports is a big problem for us. <laughs> Right, if that, if what we're trying to do is social reform, and I mean, Acre and Belmont are dramatic exceptions to the rule. It sort of depends who your audience is and how you, um, sometimes you can get to the influentials, right? Mm -hmm. Without, and then it, it kind of drips down <laughs> in some way. It just sort of depends what, who your audience is and what the issue is, I think. Um, uh, now, I mentioned, uh, and, how many of you know Hans von Melden? He used to be head of Scions. He is now the head of the National Politics Committee, uh, the chair of the Politics Committee. And he was telling me just last week at a meeting, um, the committee, we were at dinner, and he said, You know, when I was a young doctor, uh, Hans is very early 50s, when I was a young doctor, I, I got very interested in DNR. And I wrote the first DNR policy published in the Netherlands. And I was so proud. And he said, now I'm going back, he's given up some responsibilities, kind of going back to the clinic, and he said, I was giving a talk to the, some residents the other day, and I said, well, you know, of course, according to DNR policy, it wouldn't be like I was from Mars. So I wrote a great policy, <laughs> but even the hospitals didn't, you know, didn't implement it. So yes, I mean, this happens. Uh, so there has to be an implementation strategy. Mm -hmm. But um, if we don't make an explicit decision about whether we're going to propose social reform, we won't ensure always that we have a separate well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, you can publish it, and, mm -hmm. right, and it goes into the OZO, and it goes on your resume, and yeah. that's, that's that, right? That's why commission stuff is so great, right? Because generally, there is a plan for implementation. Okay, it doesn't usually work so well, but there's a plan at least to try.
and so then if you don't do anything about them, there's actually like a, a weird kind of integrity problem there, right? Like I, you know, I believe with all my being as a professional and an expert that we ought to like you know mitigate the harms of climate change, and then I just keep it to myself. Like that actually feels a little bit problematic. Yeah. So the media thing, you know, try and make change seems totally reasonable and appropriate, if yeah. not required. But you have this thing at the end of your very cool history lesson about the kind of um, international order and such, and everything that I just said doesn't rely on that at all. Nothing. But, you mean nothing relies on that? Well, so, relies. so that bioethics would be advocacy by its nature as a normative, uh, uh, practical normative inquiry, aside from this kind of historical background that you laid out. And so I guess I just wondered why you think this is a, a worry or a question here that okay. these yeah, sorts of I mean, well, Let's put it this way. What's going on in Europe right now? Right. Particularly Brexit. So Brexit is mainly described as an economic project after the, after the war, uh, decades after the war. Starting with the common market, right, and then you know, piecing these 28 whatever it is countries together <coughs> in economic coalition. And it's also, by the way, an easier way to get one country to another without your passport. But it was also a peace project. The European Union was a peace project. That these countries that have sucked us in the two world wars, uh, you know, that should not happen again. And so, and so what are the assumptions behind that project? Well, uh, human rights, dignity, however, you, whatever you want to call it. Those are core assumptions. Uh, and it is no accident that the first trial, literally as well as figuratively, of that question is the so-called Nazi doctrine. That is no accident no if you look at the way this evolved. So uh, if there are doubts about those norms and values and standards as they apply universally, then I think it, it leads me to this slide. I'm not sure if that's really an adequate answer for you. Yeah. Uh, and then what's the basis for the, you know, what are the assumptions we make for social reform? Doing better in one part of the world in, in informed consent for human experiments, does that not matter in other parts of the world? We can accept that. Right? Uh, so, I don't know, it's, it's making me queasy. Um, and I guess, all I, again, all I want to say is that what's going on in these large quarters, I'm not, I'm not the only person who started this, but it just strikes me that people in bioethics, in general, particularly in this country, don't appreciate how, how much a part of the fabric of the international world the field is. Thank you for an interesting presentation. I use the word, you use the word liberal many, many times, and it seemed to me that it primarily was talking about political, modern political liberalism as opposed to classical liberalism. No, no classical, classical liberalism. liberalism. Thank you for pointing out classical liberalism. Yeah. Respect for human, uh, human equality, human dignity. That's classical liberalism. Everybody gets to be in the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. Adam Smith writes The Wealth of Nations. He also writes are the moral sentiments. Right. Uh, how do you get to be in the marketplace? Because what's cool about the marketplace is because you and I are on even ground. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter whether a prince, a potentate, or a pauper. If I've got something you want, then you just don't take it from me. Or something like that. Like, okay, you got to pay me. We bargain. So, uh, no, it's, it's absolutely uh, in that spirit. In that spirit. It's a lot more Go ahead, bring the microphone to the let me Let me interject a question. Um, it's a little bit following on to what Travis was asking. So if what we do when we're trying to advocate for what we think to be right, normatively so, is advocacy. And when we do that in the policy realm, it's social reform. I think that's a way of capturing it. So what would you, how would you articulate what you do in the context of your work as a fellow for the Center for American Progress? Some have called that biopolitics, right. which is not, you didn't go there, right. right? So there may be a third category which helps. I mean, I don't think when I work on communicating ideas to the public that I'm advocating in the sense that the Center for American Progress is advocating. Right. Uh, so well, it's it's political. It's a distinction. So I'm not a fellow anymore, but it's political uh, in the, with a small p, in the sense that we're trying to um, 
you're publishing papers, you're giving talks in a way that is supposed to appeal to the political class, right, to the decision makers. Uh, so in that sense, uh, so I would say they're pushing beyond, definitely agree, pushing beyond social reform. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and that was and the, when I did political stuff there, it was definitely more than that. So, well, what, what, what struck me though about the fact that at the same time I was co-chair of the National Academies Committee, which is clearly academic, but uh, and at the same time I was publishing these student screens the studies of the like Amish Yeah, I mean, just as a way of helping to navigate what's a very difficult yeah. environment, right? I mean, it's hard to know when you've crossed the line in a way that prevents you from coming back. I mean, I think it was many of us in academia fear you get labeled in a particular way. Fear in the sense of what does that do to us as right. scholars? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Alexis. Hi, I'm Alexis Walker. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Berkman Institute. Thanks for your talk. Um, so the title of the talk is Why What is, is Advocacy? And then in your laying out your argument, you said it's an invitation to advocacy. I don't know if that footage is significant, if you could speak to that, but also sort of as a second part there, um, it also seems that you sort of question whether it is or should be advocacy, especially I know that you some of your discomfort. And also in your last point, um, it seems to me that you're arguing, you know, without this baseline of international liberal order moving ahead of it is a problem. So that sort of seems to go against that argument. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I could, I guess. Let's Please. <laughs> I think when you when you do get into a so let's imagine you you know you work on uh, clinical trials you know and and you do see some issue that you think is not being um, there's not enough work writing about it and it's a problem and it's an, something is needed to fix up the institution some ins the institution of doing clinical trials um, uh, and and you start getting into it you do become an advocate, particularly if you try to get something published in something other than the report, or can't get student ethics journals. Right? So if you write an op-ed and so forth. I think that's fine. Um, and I think that works well with the view of these matters that I'm giving. I think that I think that's consistent. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, the invitation is a is almost you got to come to this party. Uh, I guess I would more than an invitation. I know it's. This is what we do. Now, um, the problem gets in when, with rhetoric, uh, and and so how you how you make the case for your for your the, the, whatever position you're advocating for uh, uh, that this is where things become a little dicey, which is why I say there's no uh, there's no hard and fast rule for this. Um, so can I give you another example? Uh, Twelve years ago, Larry Gostin chaired a committee for the National Academies on prison research. And I was on it, and we concluded that there should be more prison research, uh, particularly in social behavior. Uh, so okay, we gave some recommendations. The night it was released, or maybe the next night, Colbert had a lot of fun. He said, so the scientists at the National Academy say that we should do experiments on prisoners. Yes! I think we should do a lot of experiments on prisoners. Oh my god, this really wasn't fun. Um, so, um, besides telling you that story about Colbert, um, <laughs> the way that you, you present and convey you know, means a lot, and it can be taken uh, in a direction you don't want to go. Um, um, and you're more subject to criticism if you are really advocating for a position like that. So evidence-based, um, sound arguments, um, but you will be singled out as an advocate for something that other people think is kind of screwy. Whereas if you're doing mainstream social reform stuff, who's not for informed consent? Uh, who's not for doing more research on prisoners? Probably some of you are not for doing more research. Okay, I, you're all probably that I can't give, and there's just no formula for this, but I do think that the deeper you get into a particular area of my life, the more likely you are to fall into an advocacy role. And then you have to think about how you're going to do that. 
how assertive, what's the audience, what's the, what kind of language you're using, how confident you are in your arguments, your evidence. I know, that's a list. What's your evidence? Interesting and you know that with these things. Yes? Hi, I'm uh, Hi, John Mariah Merritt, Urban Institute, uh, School of Public Health also. So we recently had a talk in the School of Public Health by a political scientist named Jeremy Schiffman, who argued that, it, as a descriptive claim, the field of global health is a field of power relations that you can study from the standpoint of political science in that way. Suppose bioethics is just really a manifestation of power relations. If you want to um, you know, advance the views that bioethics uh, helps us to form, you, yeah. it, it really matters who is in power and what they do with it. So to answer that question, I'm just entertaining this. Yeah. Why not just openly say, look, we're involved in a field of power relations and let's act like it. So you so, don't need a sort of normative right, right. program. Just just exert your power. Right. <laughs> so let's take the right to try and move. Now a matter of federal law. Right to try, the underlying argument is, hey, you guys have power. You scientists and you clinicians, and you know, we want that power. Who gave you the right? That's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a power argument. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you can argue it reduces the power of um, I, I still tend to think that there's got to be a normative element in there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, the yeah. question is, how do we reconcile the two, right? Like, in other words, I think because we're so impressed with our normative yeah. splendor, right. we might forget that we're also essentially trying to exert power, and that there's some, you know, like there's something, some, I think that's what you're getting at. Is, yeah, yeah, is exactly. it so wrong yeah. to want to exert power? Yeah. And if it's not, then what is the relationship between that desire and one's ostensible normative okay. vocation? Right. So it's a massive rejection of expertise that's going on now. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it's partly, uh, I thought Andrew Ross Sorkin had a nice piece about a week, 10 days ago, about this. In the wake of 2008, uh, uh, the Great Recession, massive loss of confidence in expertise. And although you and I were, you know, the economists, <laughs> and the financial people who let Lehman go, uh, we are nonetheless experts. Why? Because we're out, you know, we're going to look at the standard place. Right? Uh, look what we get to do all day. Uh, so um, this is part of the, re the rebellion against expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the international order tries to do right, is, to, uh, is to provide a globalized structure of expertise in different areas, in economics, in national security stuff, and in values related questions, human rights questions. Uh, and so you don't want that? Okay, we'll go back to 1939. Uh, pays your money, takes your choice. Uh, and so are we going back to 1939? I don't know. I thought 1968 was pretty bad. Uh, um, 2018 is not working out so well. Uh, I used to say to people, hey, it's, it's not you know, 1939. But it does seem to me that you, you nailed something that I really shouldn't, which is that uh, this is about expertise. And there's a, a small literature about moral expertise, late 80s, early 90s, moral consensus, moral expertise, that's maybe worth looking at again, uh, in light of the environment we find ourselves in. I think we unfortunately need to end on that note. Um, so the rest of 2018 is better than the first part. <laughs> <laughs> Although hopefully you all have been unaware of the news since we've been sitting here, but there is news to review when you're back online. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, thank John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>